happen. Um, very big end, and I'll manage to get through the hour without a problem. Um, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Just seeing where my levels are here on 80 meters. One, two, three, four. <clears throat> I can hear lots of hum there for some reason, and it's really quite disconcerting. <laughs> um, no, it's not going to do anything either. Just mucking around with the EQ. Um, all right. Um, all right. Well, we're back up on YouTube for how long, I don't know, but we are streaming uh, on YouTube. The indicator is red. And uh, I should have uh, things happening if you uh, wish to look at my YouTube channel. Hopefully it will hang in there now for the next hour. It's always something. Um, g'day Martin, VK7JAH is tuned in there on Discord and uh, Cassiopeia. Um, oops, and there's just something else I've realised. Hang on a sec. I've just got to get up and turn things down. Ugh. Down. All right, it's down. Oh, some of the local feedback. Uh, all right. Um, all right. I think uh, levels are okay. All right. Um, members are also encouraged to make use of the society's country property located near Heathcote, some 90-minute drive north of Melbourne. There are a range of instruments available for members to use. Uh, and the larger two with appropriate training, and they range from 300 to 1,000 millimetre in aperture. Also located on the site is an 8.5 fully steerable radio telescope, uh, which members can access with involvement in the radio astronomy section. Members are encouraged to make and use telescopes. Advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same. Instrument making is only one of the number of common interest activities catered for within the society. Other areas of interest that members can participate in include deep sky observing, astrophotography, lunar and planetary observing, rural, meteor, comet, radio astronomy, computing, cosmology and astrophysics historical studies, and research and astronomy in general. Uh, contact details for various section directors are provided in the yearbook. Further information may be obtained by visiting the ASV website and uh, notifications of events are given in the Crux Extra Bulletins, which is an email edition that's uh, sent out every other week so or so to keep members informed of what's happening with the, uh, the latest news on the ASV. Um, please note that ASV will conform to all government health directives and also ASV events may be required to be cancelled, moved or postponed depending on circumstances. You can write to the Secretary of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, that's the Secretary of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Victoria 3001 if you wish to send a email. Um, Second YouTube stream seems okay. However, however what? <laughs> Can someone prove a YT link, please? Oh, just just type in VK3CSJ nibs. Um, just just go to the the Google search engine, um, the YouTube YouTube search engine, and just type in VK3CSJ and look for the live uh, symbol, live indication. It's as simple as that. All right, I'm going to take my headphones off because I, I can I can hear hum, 50 cycle hum from somewhere. Oh, it's far better, and uh, it's just annoying me. So I'm hoping it's not uh, too much of an issue to uh, you blokes on um, on 80 meters. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm really driving. I'm trying to keep actually trying to keep the drive down a little bit because um, I think it's just RF getting into my modem that's uh, a problem. So for yeah, all right. We should be um, up around the 200 watt level or so, which should be enough. All right, uh, we've got a few articles tonight. Let's hope I can get through them all. And um, the uh, my COVID situation seems to be pretty much over. Although I still, as I speak, I can still I still sound a bit nasally, um, but. Um, I think all the symptoms are pretty much gone. I've had to wear a, a blasted mask at work all week, all this week, which has been a really annoying. Even now, as I speak to you, I can feel the impression of this mask on my face. Really hate that. 
Uh, never mind, I found it. Okay, good. <laughs> Just looking at the chat there on the chat window. All right, just finished my cup of coffee, which is my special Arecibo cup of coffee. It's come all the way from Arecibo. <laughs> Not quite. Um, all right, good evening all. G'day, Bill. Okay, 3KHT has joined us as well. Um, okay, uh, full strength on 80 meters. Good audio. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Uncle Wayne. Um, now, let's get into it because um, I, I don't want to be uh, running over over time tonight. Um, there's no Tamitha updates. She hasn't released any latest solar report, so don't have to worry about running anything from Tamitha. So, let me see. Where is my uh, lineup of articles here? Um, okay, let's just get straight into this, okay? <laughs> um, 11 minutes past the hour. Uh, this is a, an article held off from last week. Um, didn't quite have enough time to get to it. Uh, Beetlejuice uh, may be the result of a quiet star merger, published 9th of November. Astronomers presented the intriguing possibility that Betelgeuse did not start off as a single star, but is instead the product of a quiet merger. And they've provided an image of uh, Betelgeuse. Um, uh, and uh, I'll just bring that up. And see if my insert's working. Can I bring up my picture? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, a, it's not really on me. Hang on a sec. Let me move my secondary camera here so it's sort of on me there. Yep, that's good enough. Okay. So that's a real picture of Betelgeuse in, in that image there. Um, okay. Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse, maybe. Uh, the second brightest star in the familiar constellation Orion is a strange giant star. Recent observations have revealed that it spins much faster and has many more heavily heavy elements mixed within it than the typical giant stars should. Recently, a team of astronomers developed a sophisticated computer simulation to explore a radical idea that Betelgeuse is the result of a merger between two smaller stars. All stars follow well-understood evolutionary tracks. They fuse hydrogen in their cores for the vast majority of their lives, leaving behind a build-up of helium as they age. Changing the ratio of hydrogen to helium in the core affects the, res the rest of the star's properties, like its size, brightness and temperature. For example, when more massive stars like Betelgeuse near the end of their lives, they develop so much helium in their cores that the hydrogen fusion moves into a shell surrounding the core, inflating the rest of the star into a red supergiant. Using this knowledge, astronomers can usually pinpoint where a star is on its evolutionary track. But Betelgeuse has some strange properties. It contains far more nitrogen in its outer atmosphere, which is a sign that its interior has been mixed recently, and it's spinning far faster than other red supergiants, indicating that something happened to the star to spin it up. Putting these pieces together, astronomers recently formed a systematic and careful analysis of the intriguing possibility that Betelgeuse did not start off as a single star, but is instead the product of a, a quiet merger. They reported their results in a preprint paper submitted to Astrophysical Journal. The team's setup was a binary system which is extremely common among high-mass stars in the galaxy. In their simulation, the primary star was 16 solar masses, and already well on its way to becoming a red supergiant. 
The companion star was much less massive, around four solar masses, and was still happily fusing hydrogen in its core. As the supergiant star aged, its atmosphere extended to the orbit of its companion, the simulation revealed. The companion star's gravity funneled that material into or onto itself, increasing its own mass. Eventually, the companion started swimming through so much material that this caused friction, thus slowing the companion and drawing it inward. What happened next depended on a variety of factors, including the speed of the companion, the star's relative masses, and how much of the primary star's atmosphere had been extended. Sometimes the merging stars briefly flared, resulting in a significant loss of mass and thus a much smaller, highly disrupted star, the simulation showed. But in Betelgeuse's case, the merger was much quieter. The companion plunged into the primary star's atmosphere, spiraling inward and eventually merging with the helium core. This process released an enormous amount of energy, ejecting some of the star's material into space in jet-like outflows, roughly equivalent to 60% of the sun's mass, our sun's mass, of the sun's mass. The influx of new material from the companion star disrupted the helium core, briefly returning the newly merged star to a hydrogen core fusing stage. The simulation showed this didn't last long, however, and the newborn Betelgeuse soon became a red supergiant again. However, Betelgeuse retained a memory of the collision. In the astronomer's model, the merger mixed up the con contents of the star, sending heavier elements like nitrogen into the upper reaches of the atmosphere, where some of it remains visible today. And... The merger added a significant amount of rotational energy to Betelgeuse. While the star presumably slowed down somewhat since the theoretical violent merger, it's still rotating much faster than it should be, it seems. Unfortunately, direct evidence of this scenario doesn't uh, or won't be easily apparent for another 50,000 to 100,000 years when Betelgeuse explodes as a supernova. When that happens, material from its inner depths will race outward, allowing future astronomers, if they exist at the time, to study the chemical makeup of the giant star in more detail. The proportion of elements will tell them whether Betelgeuse was always a solitary star uh, with strange properties, uh, or if it was, uh, in fact, a result of a merger long, long ago. So there's a little bit of an update on what we're thinking about Betelgeuse in the constellation of Orion. So there it is. Uh, yes, it's a pretty big, big star though on the scale of things. It's a, a massive object and uh, a lot of astronomers are keeping an eye on it because uh, it, it tends to vary a little bit. In its brightness and uh, we're all sort of hanging on the fact that it may go supernova at any moment but uh, as the article said there it could still be a ways off into the future we're still streaming isn't that fantastic this is vk3 echo kilo hotel the official station of the astronomical society of victoria with the regular friday night cast missions coming to you from the studio of vk3 csj in Nari Warren South. All right, here's a short, nice short article. Uh, let's see where my picture is of this. There's an image here associated with this. There it is. And there she blows. Bring me up again. Um, okay, Alma, A L M A. Alma I used to, I used to know a girl, Alma. Elmer archives its highest resolution observations yet, 15th of November, 2023. Um, the Akakama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, or ELMA, in which ESO, the uh, European Space Observatory, 
is a partner, has achieved the highest resolution observation since it began operations. During a technical test, a team of experts from the Joint ELMA Observatory, JAO, in Chile, and the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan, NAOJ, National Radio Observatory, or sorry, National Radio Astronomy Observatory, NRAO, in the USA, and ESO, ESO, managed an evolved star, or imaged, I should say, imaged an evolved star with a resolution of 5 milli arc seconds. This allows ELMA, or well, this shows ELMA, can be used by astronomers to observe objects in detail equivalent to seeing a 10 metre long bus on the moon. ELMA consists of 66 antenna, which can be arranged in different positions across the high altitude plateau, plateau in Chile which is equipped with receivers that allow it to observe radio waves in different frequency ranges or bands. Elmer's resolution increases both as the maximum separation between antennas increases and as the frequency of the observation increases. The new images were obtained with the most extended configuration possible for the Elmer array with a maximum separation between its antennas of 16 kilometers. They were made using the band 10 receivers, which allow ELMA to observe at frequencies as high as 950 gigahertz in the highest possible, the highest possible for the array. Since the observations push ELMA's capabilities to the extreme, they were incredibly challenging to conduct. While band 10 receivers have been available at ELMA since 2014, astronomers had to wait for the validation of a novel calibration technique called band-to-band -to, -band to be able to conduct the new observations. They did so during a technical test in 2021 when they observed an evolved Milky Way star R. Leporis, using a bright galactic core as a calibrator, which, while distant, appears nearby R. Leporis in the sky, the results are published today in the Astrophysical Journal. This result has been achieved with significant support from ESO staff who were involved in the test observations. The previous experiments in the lead up to this final technical achievement and the development of the new calibration technique. Of course, more information can be found if you go to, uh, well, they say here the result was presented in a paper titled L L titled ALMA High Frequency Long Baseline campaign in 2021 anyway whatever so <laughs> so uh yes um oh there's a little graphic there that kind of shows what they were doing but i didn't save that anyway so elmer achieves its highest resolution observations at a frequency of 950 gigahertz with the antenna separated at 16 kilometers is the summary of that article which can be found on the European Southern Observatory page website uh, and uh, I hope that was interesting <laughs> um, anyway we're getting there with some other interesting stuff um, let me see stargazing oh yes okay this is a bit of a lengthy article I, I've held over two weeks on this one uh, but it's a little bit of history here so uh, about a, um, a telescope an optical telescope and I thought we'll make this the kind of like the main article for tonight at 24 past the hour we've got plenty of time here um, hum I can hear that 80 meters hum now it seems to be oscillating up and down a little at times something loose somewhere yeah we don't seem, I, I haven't done anything though that's the thing since um, 
since last Friday. So I don't just it's just amazes me the shake. Am I still streaming? Yes, I'm still streaming. That's good. <laughs> okay. All right. There's a few images associated with this article. So I shall bring up uh, the starting image and uh, bring me up there. All right. So uh, stargazing into the past and future of a historic obser- observatories. Um as ever larger telescopes are launched into space or built at high altitude sites, these observatories still have wonders to share with visitors and astronomers alike. Right, just seeing where this article starts. At the top of Mount Hamilton near San Jose, California, The Lick Observatory, L-I-C-K, the Lick Observatory looks out over the dense sprawling of San Francisco Bay Area. On a clear day from the 4,200 foot summit, you can see San Francisco to the north as well as the entrance to uh, to, um, uh, Yosemite Valley, I think that's how you pronounce that, 120 miles east as the crow flies. At night you can see even the farther millions of years of lights into the into space and there's another image here um, not too long after some fires went through um, okay there it is and some fires rage went raging through this area a little while ago but fortunately the observatory was saved um, so what in, that, in this image here you're seeing the Lick Observatory is home to several telescopes including the 36-inch Crosley Telescope whose dome is seen in the distance in this image. When it was completed in 1888, Lick, named for its sponsor James Lick, boasted the best telescopes and the best year-round conditions of any observatory in the world. Its white domes were beacons for astronomers and visiting dignitaries as well as hundreds of curious locals who made the long journey to up the mountain each weekend. Now, Lick Observatory is one of only a few remaining historic observatories still open to the public in the United States. Contemporary funding prioritises ever larger telescopes in dark, dry, high-altitude sites like the Chile's Atacama Desert or space-borne telescopes such as the Hubble Space Telescope or James Webb Space Telescope. Theirs are the extraordinary discoveries that regularly make the news. But historic observatories still have wonders to share with visitors and astronomers alike. Lick Observatory and the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona, which opened in 1894, both remain active in astronomical research. Other historical observatories now focus primarily on public outreach and education, including the Yerkes Observatory, uh, 1897 in Williams Bay, Wisconsin, and Mount Wilson Observatory, 1904, outside Pasadena, California. At each of these sites, you can step into the history of the cosmos, experiencing the deep time of the stars, as well as more recent histories of discoveries, of discovery. Looking through 19th century glass at Lick, you can see where E. E. Barnard spotted a new moon of Jupiter, and James Keeler found a gap in Saturn's rings. At Mount Wilson, Edward Hubble, building on work done by Henrietta Swan Levitt at Harvard, made an observation that proved that there were galaxies in the universe beyond the Milky Way. At Yerkes Observatory, you can peer through a 40-inch refracting telescope that surpassed Lick's in size in 1897 and was used by a cadre of path-breaking women working in astronomy. And there's a couple of images here of uh, this telescope. Uh, Let's see, this one here. Okay, I've got two images, one here. 
Um, so on the left of the image you see on the screen, the left image, uh, is the eyepiece of the James Lick Telescope, also called the Great Lick Reflector. Refractor, sorry. When completed in, nine, in 1888, it was the largest refracting telescope in the world. Today, it is second in size to the 40-inch Yerkes Observatory refractor. And on the right side of that is a, another image of the refractor, an, an archival photograph of the Great Lick refractor. Um, giving you a bit more of an open view of the uh, inside of the observatory. Pretty, pretty big telescope and uh, observing area. Just almost, just a little bit bigger than the dome that's going to be uh, built in the backyard here in a few weeks' time. <laughs> anyway, continuing on with this article, uh, as the artist Aspen Mays. As the artist Aspen Mays and I prepared to visit Mount Hamilton this fall, she remained, reminded me of yet another layer of time we would be transversing on our trek up the mountain. The white domes that now stand as, a accidental, as accidental monuments uh, to anthropogenic change in the valley below, the lick most people can barely see the stars at night because of light pollution. Although the skies like lick were exceedingly dark through the 1940s, post-war growth led the observatory to start researching new locations in the mid-1960s. As the astronomer Merle Walker explained when the results were published in 1970, he said the quality of the observing conditions at Mount Hamilton has begun to deteriorate due to the increase in lights and smog, he said. The metropolitan adjacent locations at Mount Hamilton and other historic observatories now seem acutely incongruous, with sky glow clearly visible from these once dark sites, dark sky sites. They are potent reminders of just how much has changed since the construction. But visiting them now can also inspire us to reverse those changes, both at historic sites and in places where we live. The narrow winding road to Mount Hamilton Summit is, uh, is, is scrawled through golden hills overhung by oaks. Halfway up the mountain, the fog-like marine layer pulls away in tatters revealing steep cliffs on the outside edge of the road and piles of dusty rock in the tight turns. The smell of pine and the calls of a corn woodpeckers merge with the sunlight and a passel of wide boar pick their way through the glasses, grasses sorry, with small ones nibbling as they go. For a few miles the observatory is hidden by the sharp accent of or ascent of the mountain. In Lick's observatory, historical collections, images of astronomical objects are interspersed with scenes of daily life on the mountain. You may find a snapshot of fog swirling in the valley filed uh, in next to the photograph of the moons of Sea of Tranquility uh, or a uh, convical picnic followed by a comet barreling through the black sky. Some of these astronomical photographs would redefine what we know of Earth's place in the vast universe. Yet as the staff, yet as the staff astronomer Eleanor Gates told me, the, uh, uh, the author, nothing compares to seeing these objects through the eyepiece of a telescope on the mountain. You might look at a galaxy and it's 25 million light years away, she said, with visible enthusiasm. It's taken 25 million years for that light to get from that galaxy, come through the telescope to the eyepiece to your eyeball. It's a different experience when than just looking at a pretty picture on a computer screen or in a book. Here she said you can actually start to experience the depth of time. <clears throat> Standing at the base of the Great Lick Refractor, I am stunned by its scale. 
its tube reaches 57 feet toward the steep pitch of the dome, a 99-tonne galvanised steel behemoth capable of rotating 360 degrees to accommodate the telescope's opening. The walls are panelled with uh, fragrant local red wood. Even the floor is exceptional, not only for its elegant circular parquet, but because the whole thing is an elevator which once lifted astronomers up to the level of the eyepiece no matter where the telescope was pointed, and all of this material bounced and creaked up the mountain behind mules more than a century ago. And I've got a, a picture of that area, not, not so much the mules, um, but uh, this one here. This, this one shows the uh, parquet of the floor, the way it's designed. And um, uh, have I got that picture there? Maybe not. Don't think so. All right. So uh, in that image you're seeing there on screen uh, is staff astronomer Eleanor Gates, who stands below the Great Lick Refractor on Mount Hamilton. John Barantine, um, or Tyne, John Barantine, an astronomer and consultant focused on dark skies research and conservation, believes that looking through a telescope can be transformative. If I show somebody the moon through a telescope, they can, for the first time, envision it as a place, he told me. Now, they have had a kind of direct experience with it, but those rewards, he cautioned, are dependent on if and how we rain in light pollution on the ground. There is a growing collection of scientific literature documenting the harmful effects of light pollution, which impacts far more than astronomical observation. Humans evolved under the sky. Our biology remains connected to its rhythms and darkness and light. Uh, a myriad, uh, myriad of other species also rely on the natural night sky for everything from navigation to hunting, growth and reproduction. In his book called The Darkness Manifesto, the zoologist Johann Yekloff describes in detail the negative effects of excess artificial light on plants, animals, including birds, bats, sea turtles and corals. Dr. Eloff notes that half of the world's insects are nocturnal. They are easily led astray by artificial lights at night, which create a vacuum cleaner effect. On a large scale, this can draw insects from more rural areas to brightly lit cities and lead to changes in the entire ecosystem. And there's another picture here. Uh, this one here, I think. Back to the article. Ecosystem. In this image on the screen right now, it's actually a combination of two images, but uh, what you're seeing there is the uh, original plate, an archival photograph from 1892. It shows Comet Holmes, Holmes and the Andromeda Nebula. At the time, Andromeda was thought to be a nebula within our own galaxy, we now recognise it as the nearest major galaxy to the Milky Way. Um, despite our awareness of its harms, light pollution is advancing at an alarming rate. A groundbreaking 2016 study which used satellite data to evaluate artificial night sky brightness globally determined that 80% of the world's population lived under light polluted skies. In a a more recent study, data collected by citizen scientists have been used to determine that on average, the night sky brightened by 9.6% per year between 2011 and 2022. In observable terms, the study's authors explain this means that if you could count 250 stars outside tonight, in just 18 years you'll see only 100 in the same location. 
Dr. Baratine told me that the technical solutions for fighting light pollution are known and proven. Uh, all we are missing, he, sh he said, is that is the will to put those in place. These include implementing local lighting ordinance ordinances that limit outdoor lightning to where and when it is useful and regulating the colors of outdoor lightning to no longer to to longer wavelengths like amber so that the scattering is less pervasive per, 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 pervasive is the word <laughs> The other part of this image on the screen too is archival logs show astronomers' observation notes. So um, this is the sort of thing um, I, I hope to develop for myself when I get my dome working as my own uh, astronomer's logbook of notes and interesting information. So very interesting to see that. <clears throat> Flagstaff, home of Lowell Observatory, has been protected has been protecting the dark sky as a natural resource for more than half a century. Geoffrey Hall, Lowell's executive director, told me that you can still see the Milky Way from downtown. The city's first lightning ordinance, ordinance passed in 1958, prohibited the use of advertising searchlights. By the late 1980s, the ordinance was strengthened to require shielded outdoor lights that directed illumination downward, as well as spectrum management, which limits approved lighting to certain wavelengths. Dr. Barentine suggested that light pollution is the environmental challenge that we sh could definitely solve in our lifetimes, and our success, he said, could benefit far more than just a field of astronomy. We need a win as a species, he said. We need people to believe that we can take on significant problems and solve them. Those significant problems are all around us today. The charred skeletons of oak and manazenita sketch a haunting ring around Lick Observatory. In August of 2020, lightning ignited the drought-stricken hillsides. Residents were evacuated and several structures were lost, but the fire crews managed to save the historic domes and the equipment. When Aspen Mays and I visited it this fall, smoke from wildfires burning along the California-Oregon border had drifted hundreds of miles south, drawing an arid stream, stream, scrim, Scrim, S-C-R-I-M, Scrim, over the Bay Area. As Aspen pointed out, when these observatories were built, their founders compiled years of meteorological research to confirm the site's future vi viability. No one expected the very climate to change at the time. At historic at historic observatories we can see the enormous gains we've made in understanding our place in the universe but they can also show us what we've lost and what we are continuing to lose if we don't do more about how to limit our impact on the planet and the sky above i think that will do for that so that's courtesy of, um, of uh, actually it's New York Times I'm reading that from. Um, so I've kept that page open for the last uh, three or so weeks. Uh, New York Times, that I found that article, surprisingly enough. Anyway, there it is. <clears throat> this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast good evening everybody we're still streaming thank goodness for that uh okay g'day richard he's tuned into the discord channel vk3 vrs and uh so far no no other email has come through next article at 16 minutes two and i don't have a glass of water with me damn it um, E equals MC squared. Oh, yes, I learnt this a long time ago. 
This is a short article. I hope I can get through it, though, because it's got mathematics in it. Um, November 6, astronomy.com. And there's a picture of the collider here, the Large Hedron Collider, a picture of it. Um, where are we? Where are we? There it is. Uh, okay, this is a very quick article anyway. Does E equals M MC squared hold true for dark matter and dark energy? Have you often asked that question? In short, this is true for all forms of matter and energy. Does E equals MC squared hold true for dark matter and dark energy? Here's a question asked by Gary George, Cincinnati in Ohio. Ohio, Ohio. <laughs> well, yes, in short, this is true for all forms of matter and energy, including dark matter and dark energy. But there are some important details to consider. E equals mc squared is a special case of the full equation E squared equals mc squared squared plus pc squared. Now, the term pc represents the kinetic energy of an object, which means that the familiar E equals mc squared is only exactly true for objects at rest or in the same rest frame, where the momentum P is zero. That's why the mass M in the equation is also referred to as a rest mass. Usually, the part of the equation containing the rest mass is much larger than the kinetic energy. Then, E equals mc squared is a good approximation of everything that doesn't move at a significant fraction of the speed of light. And speaking of light, protons, the particles of light and electromagnetism, are the other extreme of the full equation. They have no rest mass, so the term becomes zero, but they still have momentum and thus energy. The fact that kinetic energy is also part of the total energy of particles is exploited by scientists at, at particle accelerators like the Large Hedron Collider at CERN, pictured. By accelerating particles to nearly light speed, new particles can be created in head-on collisions that have even more rest mass than the original ones. Researchers use this method to search for dark matter particles by trying to create dark matter from the mass and energy of other particles. The equation even holds true for dark energy. The simplest way to understand dark energy is as the energy held by the vacuum of space itself. So even in the most perfect vacuum without a single particle of matter, there is some tiny amount of energy. For example, the dark energy content of a sphere enclosed by the moon's orbit would only equate to a mass of about 3 pounds, or 1.4 kilograms, which is easily overshadowed by pretty much everything else within that volume. However, as the universe is mostly a lot of empty space, this tiny amount of energy held by the vacuum of space amounts to the majority of the total energy content in the universe. Due to the odd properties of dark energy, the gravitational pull generated by its mass equivalent is easily overcome by its negative pressure, which is the force driving the accelerated expansion of the universe. There it is. Nice and quick. <clears throat> you can find that on astronomy.com. Uh, and I think that's under... Oh, where is it? It's um, back to article list. i just seen where I've found that. <clears throat> Ask Astro. Yep. On astronomy.com, there's a, a feature or a, uh, a tab. It's called Ask Astro. And they, they're usually very short um, uh, answers to questions. 
such as that one. And um, that's where you found that. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3EKH. All right, next article. Uh, where are we? Where are we? Elma. Back to Elma. Here's another one from Elma. And we have a picture of that. Bring that up. Uh, Elma observation of young star reveals details of dust grains. Highest resolution dust polarization image ever taken toward a protoplanetary disk, which is what you're seeing there. One of the primary goals of the Akakama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, ELMA, is to study the formation of and evolution of planetary systems. Young stars are often surrounded by a disk of gas and dust, out of which planets can form. One of the first highest resolution images that ELMA captured was of HL Tauri, a young star just 480 light years away, surrounded by a protoplanetary disk. The disk has visible gaps, which could be where young protoplanets are forming. Planetary formation is a complex process that will uh, that that uh, that we still don't fully understand. During this process, dust gains grains in the disk are growing in size as they collide and stick together causing them to slowly grow into potentially becoming objects similar to those within our solar system. One of the ways to study dust grains in these complex structures is to look at the orientation of light waves they emit, which is known as polarization. Earlier studies of HL Tauri have mapped this polarization, but a new study from Stevens uh, has captured a polarization image of HL Tauri in unprecedented detail. The resulting image is based on ten by more than po- ten times more polarization measurements uh, than of any other disk, and one hundred times more measurements than most disks. It is by far the deepest polarization image of any disk captured thus far, according to the research published today, Nature. In, in nature. The image you're seeing on the screen right now uh, was captured at a resolution of 5, um, five AU, Australian, um, <laughs> Australian, 5 astronomical units, which is about the distance from the Sun to Jupiter. Previous polarization observations were at much lower resolution and didn't reveal the subtle pattern of polarization within the disk. For example, the team found the amount of polarized light to be greater on one side of the disk than the other. This is likely due to the asymmetries in the distribution in the dust grains or their properties across the disk. Dust grains aren't often spherical. They can be obliterated like a thick pancake or prolate like a grain of rice. When light is emitted or by sorry, when light is emitted by or scatters off these dust grains, it can become polarized, meaning that the waves of light are orientated in a particular direction rather than just randomly. These new results suggest that, that grains behave more like prolate grains and they are strong constraints on the shape and size of dust grains within the disk. A result, a surprising result of the study is that there is more polarization within the gaps of the disk than the rings. Even though there are there is more dust in the rings, the polarization within the gaps is more as as a methyl, which suggests the polarization becomes or comes from aligned dust grains within the gaps. The polarization of the rings is more uniform, suggesting the polarization largely comes from scattering. In general, the polarization comes from a mix of scattering and dust alignment. Based on the data, it is unclear what is causing the dust grains to align, but they are likely not aligned 
along magnetic field in the disc, which is the case for most dust outside the, of planet, pl protoplanetary disks. Currently, it is thought that the grains are aligned mechanically, perhaps by their own aerodynamics, as they evolve around a central young star. What will studies of HL Tauri Tau reveal next? The new publication makes clear that high resolution is needed for polarization observations to learn the details about the dust grains. As, as the world's most powerful millimeter submillimeter telescope, ELMA, will be a fundamental instrument for continuing this research. And that's courtesy of National Radio Observatory, National Radio Astronomy Observatory, NRAO website. Elm observations of young star reveals details of dust grains, and you can you can just see that in this image here, which is really quite quite fascinating. <sighs> okay, you're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, and we're down to the last five minutes already. All right, the next thing I was going to quick oh, got a glass of water, damn it. Anyway, we'll make this the last article for tonight. <coughs> I got a picture here. Uh, where I'll be? There we are. All right. Remembering Frank Borman, the astronaut who led America to the moon. A West Point graduate and test pilot, Borman had a master's degree in aeronautical engineering from Caltech and commanded the Apollo 8 mission. Published November 15. Last week, passing of Frank Borman, who led humanity's first circumnavigation of the moon, reduces the surviving number of Apollo lunar voyages to eight. Aged 95, Borman was the oldest living space traveller, an uncomplicated military man of grit, tenacity and unswavingly devotion to the mantra of duty, honour and country, espoused by his beloved West Point. Nick named Squarehead at school an unflattering reference to the general con contours of uh, his cranial structure, Borman wrote. This unwanted uh, epithet returned to haunt him decades later atop towering Tucson billboards. Welcome home, Squarehead, they crowded as this stern, chisel jawed Air Force pilot. Parad paraded his boyhood hometown at Arizona as Arizona's first astronaut. Frank Frederick Borman II, a descendant of Hanoverian immigrants from Germany, was born in Gary, Gary, Indiana, on March 14, 1928, the son of an automobile mecha mechanic father and mother who traced her roots to the well-heeled English town of Bath. Borman's sinus problems led his parents to uproot from Indiana's cool, damp climate and relocate westward. In the unspoiled, spacious beauty of Arizona's second city, the boy shined. In inheriting from Edward, Edwin and Marjorie Borman a steely work ethic and love for the outdoors, often bringing home toads and gophers and gila monster to his father's horror and a huge triantula. That yearning for adventure was overwhelmed aged five by aviation when Edward took his son on a brainstorming or barnstorming ride in a, in a uh, decrepit World War I biplane, decrepit World War I biplane. He says, I was captivated, Borman wrote, by the feel of the wind and the sense of freedom that the flight created so magically. Each Sunday, he flew rubber band propelled model airplanes, and at, at uh, age 15, with cash earned sweeping shop floors, badgering gro bagging groceries, and pumping gas, he took flying lessons. A lifelong love affair with the sky was born. Another love affair bloomed with Susan Bug 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 Buggy Bugby Bugby. <laughs> this is surnames, I tell you. A blonde, beautiful, and brainy surgeon's daughter married 1950. They had two sons, Fred and Edward. 
Borman entered military academy at West Point, graduating eighth in his class, then joined the Air Force uh, after serving as an instructor pilot. He earned a master's degree in aeronautical engineering from Caltech and uh, then held a assistant professorship in thermodynamics and fluid mechanics at West Point. He com- completed test pilot school alongside future astronauts Mike Collins and Jim Irwin. Selected in, no- in September 1962 into NASA's second astronaut class, the New Nine, whose roster included Neil Armstrong and Ed White, his 3,600 hours in jets set him apart from his peers. Chief Astronaut Dick Slayton felt the decisive, no-nonsense Borman was tenacious enough for long-duration spaceflight. After backing up Gemini 4 in June 1965, he was appointed a to command Gemini 7 with Jim Lovell at his pilot as his pilot. Their flights sought to prove that men could survive two weeks in space, the time needed to travel to the moon and back. But Gemini 7 changed the direction when the misfortune hit a pres- preceding mission. Jim, Gemini 6 astronauts Wally, Cherie and Tom Stafford were, were to rendezvous, rendezvous with an unmanned uh, agenda target vehicle, but the agenda exploded shortly after liftoff on October 1965, eliminating their rendezvous target and scratching their mission. Plans were formulated by uh, to fly Borman and Lovell in December as Gemini 6's new target, the first time two US manned spacecraft flew together. An early plan called for the pilots to spacewalk from ship to ship. Stafford returning home with Borman on Gemini 7, Lovell and Shearer on Gemini 6. But Borman possessed, possessed of, of an unshakable focus on the mission and uh, regarded such capers with disdain. A spacewalk might make headlines, he, he opin- uh, uh, um, opinioned, but one little slip could lose the farm, he said. Gemini 7 rose from Pad 19 at Florida's Cape Kennedy on 2.30pm Eastern Standard Time on December 4, 1965. Its Titan II rocket inserting Borman and Lovell into a 186 mile or 300 kilometer orbit. They performed 20 experiments, executed station keeping tests with the Titan second stage and wore comfortable soft space suits. They even sang top 40 hits to pass the time. And there's another picture here of uh, Borman being picked up from a splashdown. Frank Borman is hoisted from the water by a recovery helicopter from Gemini 7 splashdown in Western Atlantic Recovery Area in December 18, 1965. But the comfort proved a scarce commodity. Cabin temperatures grew insufficiently warm and they endured stuffy noses and burning eyes. Then a urine bag burst in Borman's hand. That would have been pleasant. Before or after, asked flight surgeon Chuck Berry, after, replied, detected detected Borman. Berry winched, sorry, but that, sorry about that, chief, said the, uh, Surgeon, but after the rendezvous with Gemini Six proved the mission's high watermark on December 15, Shearer and Stafford approached within 130 feet, 40 meters of Gemini Seven, and became as near as one foot uh, at one point. To station two to station keep for five hours and three orbits. Air Force diehard Borman proudly displayed a beat army card at his window to tort naval aviator Shira. This then followed on to doing 206 orbits of Earth. Gemini 7 splashed down in the Atlantic December 18 after 13 days, 18 hours, 35 minutes, 206 orbits. It remained the longest human space flight until June 1970 and the Americans' longest non-space station mission for a quarter century finally overtaken by Space Shuttle Columbia in July 1992. Borman was next named to Apollo 3 testing the command and severe module 
service module and lunar module in a highly elliptical orbit voyaging to an altitude of 4,000 miles, 6,400 kilometres, farther from Earth than ever before. Borman, Mike Collins and Bill Anders should have flown uh, the mighty Saturn V uh, rocket in the fall of 1967, but with appalling sadness, tragedy struck. On January 27, 1967, Apollo 1 astronauts Virgil Gus Grissom, Ed White and Roger Shaffey died when a flash fire swept through their spacecraft during a ground test. Borman, usually a teetotaler, admitted that he went out of out and got bombed after the disaster. We ended up throwing glasses, he said, like a scene out of an old World War I movie. More trouble lay ahead. Collins was grounded by a spinal problem and his, and his place on the crew were taken by Jim Lovell. Meanwhile, CIA reports hinted that Russia was planning a manned lunar flyby. On August 1968, NASA taped Borman's uh, mission, um, taped Borman's mission, now renamed Apollo 18, to fly 370,000 kilometres to the moon and back. And it was an audacious plan, but one that NASA hoped would bring President John F. Kennedy pledge of American boots to the lunar surface before the decades end tantalising closer. <clears throat> There's just one more image here of uh, Borman with his uh, his colleagues, and I shall bring that up. Borman, Lovell, and Anders departed space Cape Kennedy Pad 39A on December 21, 1968, riding the 363 foot tall Saturn V, the most powerful rocket ever built. They left planet Earth under 7.7 .7 million pounds or 3.5 million kilograms of thrust with an explosive equivalent about equal, Borman said, to a small atom, atom bomb. Three hours later, the Saturn V's third stage ignited for the translunar ejection, turned to burn to set Apollo 8 on course for the moon. It accelerated to the, the spacecraft to uh, over... 37,000 kilometres per second to escape Earth's gravitational influence. The three men were travelling faster than any humans had ever been before. Despite a bout of space sickness suffered by, by Bullman, the outbound journey was uneventful and early on Christmas Eve, Apollo 8 slipped silently into a circular orbit just 110 kilometres above the Moon's grey surface. Uh, during 10 orbits over 20 hours, they witnessed the first Earth rise from the lunar distance and uh, read from a biblical story of creation to spellbound the world. And there is a picture of that particular Earth rise. And there it is. That's the image taken. First, Anders and Lovell atoned the verses as the home planet hung like a blue and white marble in the ethereal blackness. The Borman, then Borman, closed with a good night, good luck, and a Merry Christmas, and God bless you all for you, all, all of you on the good earth, he said. Returning to Earth and a Pacific Ocean splashdown on December 27 triggered a bout of sea sickness in Borman. Lovell and Anders showed no mercy. He said, they said, what do you expect? They teased from the West Point grounded pounder. Finally, the ground pounder later joined Eastern Airlines, rising to become chairman of the board. In retirement, Borman purchased a cattle ranch in Matana's Bighorn Mountains and after John Glenn's death in December 2016, was the oldest living space traveller, a title now held by Jim Lovell. Yet even in later life, Borman regarded the moon with awestruck wonder. He says, I can't believe I was really there, he told NASA's Oral History of Project, but most often I find, just, uh, I, I, find I just revel in the beautiful moon. And Borman's name figuratively and literally remains there, in the deep south of the moon's far side, with an impact f feature named Apollo lies a 30, 30 mile wide, 50 kilometre crater, sh sharp edged, 
with a rough general flat interior. The crater bears the name Borman, honouring a man who led our first faltering steps out of the Earth's protective embrace and into the universe around us. Okay, there it is. I didn't think that would go that long, but it did. Remembering Frank Borman, the astronaut who led America to the moon. And uh, he was aged 95. So that's it for tonight, I think. And um, I think, oh, a solar weather report. Yes, why not? I always do that, don't I? Uh, <laughs> all right, courtesy of spaceweather.com. And I shall bring up uh, the disk of the sun. Uh, there it is. Okay. For those watching visions. And I'm still streaming. Oh, yes, look at that. The solar wind is currently at 344 kilometers a second at a density of 1.47 protons per cubic centimeter. The current disk of the sun, which is on the screen right now, has two observable sunspots. It looks pretty quiet, actually, when you see that. Only two sunspots. Um, this is the weekend of the Leonid meteor shower, too, by the way. Uh, Leonid meteor shower this weekend. The Earth is entering a stream of debris from Comet 55 Temple Tuttle. Source of the annual Leonid meteor shower. Peak rates of 10 to 15 meteors per hour are expected overnight from November 17 to November 18. This is a far cry from the Leonid meteor storms of 1966 and 1999 uh, and 2002 where hundreds of thousands of meteors appeared. 2023 is not a great year for Leonid meteors apparently. The current sunspot number is 28. The radio sun, measured at a wavelength of 10.7 centimetres flux, is 118 solar flux units. Uh, the KP index, planetary K index, is currently 0.33, with the 24-hour max at 2.33, considered quiet. Um... There is also a geomagnetic storm watch, a filament, a magnetic filament on the sun erupted yesterday, on November 16, hurling a CME almost directly toward Earth, and there's a, a graphic of that. So there it is on the screen right now. Um... It says here that NOAA forecasters say that a, that G1 class geomagnetic storms are possible uh, when the CME arrives on November 19. During such storms, naked eye auroras or uh, auroras auroras <laughs> typically fill the Arctic circle. Circle faint uh, fainter f photographic auroras uh, are best seen using cameras and all that sort of stuff. So there it is. Uh, CME is on its way. Um, and also there is a comet report. Uh, ice volcanoes on Comet 12P Pond Brooks erupted again this week, brightening the comet 100-fold. Previous eruptions in July and October caused the comet to spout horns, but not this time. The expanding debris has formed a nearly perfect sphere. Didn't, there is a picture of it there, but I didn't take that, didn't save it. The It's a, it's a beautiful blue-green coma developing around this exploding comet. looks very similar to P-17 Holmes event in October 2007. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'll leave that at that, that one there. All right, uh, as of November 17... There are 2,349 2, potentially hazardous asteroids, but none of them are on a collision course with Earth as we speak. 
Okay, uh, do I have anything else to show there? Um, I don't think there is. Uh, I didn't even take a picture of the aurora over Antarctica. There is a ring, an auroral ring over Antarctica as we speak, but it's not very, not very strong. So there it is. All right, I'm trying to find my camera. Where is my camera? There it is. Okay. I think that's it. A quarter past the hour. I just did not think I'd go that long, but I did. Um, yep, I've, I'm just making sure i am finished everything. Um, right, I'm becoming super tired. This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast. Uh, we thank everybody for listening in tonight. Sorry for going 15 minutes over time. Didn't think I'd do that, but I did. So, uh, I shall take a quick listen on 3541 kilohertz for any stations wishing to check in. This is VK3 EKH listening. Okay. Whoops, there's a double there. VK3GL, VK3JH, I think it was. VK3 Juliet Hotel, is that correct? Oh, that's is that what it was? Okay. <laughs> oh, dear. All right. So we only have two stations, VK3GL and VK7JAH. Anyone else? Gee, all right, VK2ABT, haven't heard you for a while. Any other stations, VK3EKH? Uh, just try again that station. Okay, that's really great. Is there any other stations wishing to call in? Yep, I was just waiting for it. Okay, go ahead, Gray. VK3 GL, VK3 EKH.
Yeah, thanks, Graham. VK3 uh, GL in Bunyip. VK3 EKH returning. Yes, thanks uh, for the report. You're a good signal yourself. Uh, good 20 over uh, without a problem. And uh, fairly consistent. And yes, usually the uh, um, meteor showers are, uh, are more predominant uh, at the uh, uh, earlier hours in the morning um, from from let's say um, three or four o'clock uh, onwards through to the uh, early uh, sunrise times. That's traditionally how it goes. Um, so um, uh, um, interestingly enough, the article uh, didn't really indicate uh, that to time. Although when we look at uh, the solar uh, spaceweather.com, it's generally focused more on the northern hemisphere um but uh, this is, should still apply here of course uh the leonid meteor shower is usually in reference to the constellation leo so if uh, if you pick up your um um mobile phone with your star tracking program <laughs> and uh, look for the rise time for the constellation of leo the leo the lion uh that'll give you an idea because that Generally, the radiant uh, is focused on that part of the sky, and that'll give you an idea of the the uh, the time to uh, to be looking, or at least um, to be doing uh, uh, scatter. Um, okay, uh, thanks, uh, Gray, and uh, thanks for listening in. Um, all right. Uh, was that all the other questions, I think? Anyway, uh, across to Martin down there in Tassie, VK7JAH, VK3EKH. G'day, Martin. Yeah, thanks, Martin. VK7JAH, VK3, EKH uh, returning. And, uh, yes, look, uh, you're hovering uh, just over 9 um, tonight, um, peaking about 10. So um, my noise floor is around 8 at the moment, strength 8, 8.5, eight with a lot of lightning crashes going on somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but you're you're able to get through that without too, too many issues, uh, uh, Martin. And uh, yeah, um, the the cloud cover is 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 the bane of the optical astronomer. Um, you know we can't do too much when the clouds are around. So uh, I I don't know when I'm going to get this three meter scope dome built. Um, it still sits there on the pallet at the moment, waiting for the the install team to. Uh, to uh, arrange for a time um, but I've been reading up on telescopes and uh, I've uh, I've discovered that with my uh, Celestron CPC 800 uh, there's a, um, a device that you can add to the front of that telescope um, which uh, improves its uh, capability of, uh, of taking photographs a little bit more efficiently or, or much quicker 
uh, it's called a hyperstar, a hyperstar uh, device, and um, it's pretty much just designed for the um, for the Celestron, for the telescopes that have the um, have the capability of removing the centre part of the telescope where the second secondary mirror is. You can remove that and fit a camera directly to the front of the telescope. Which intends, which basically improves the um, uh, what they call the photographic speed of the of the telescope. How quick light is uh, is picked up by the camera. And uh, so far, there's there's been a few interesting things on YouTube about that. So fortunately, uh, uh, Celestron still have the this uh, Hyber Hyper star thing uh, still available. So I'm going to try and snaffle one. Can't wait to set it up so I can actually start taking some pictures. <laughs> so I'm, I'm doing a lot of reading on telescopes and uh, how to do this and how to do that. I just need my observatory uh, up and running. So um, hopefully very soon we'll get that sorted. Uh, yeah, um, but there won't be any, any aurora, I think, to worry about uh, at the moment, and uh, especially if there's cloud cover. Thanks, Martin. Good to hear you. Uh, excellent. Now we have Mike, VK2ABT. Haven't heard you for a while. Mike, trust you are in good health, dear friend. VK2ABT, VK3EKH. Yeah, Oh, excellent, Mike. VK2ABT, VK3EKH replying. Very good. Yeah, I have heard of that uh, 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 process uh, being uh, experimented with um, quite a few years ago, um, although it might have been a different intent, uh, but there was uh, some uh, idea to uh, place a photo diode um, of some sort on a, uh, on a normal optical telescope and uh, to collect the light from a distant star 
uh, or perhaps even looking at our sun, the local sun, and converting the the amplitude of light into a into a an, an audio tone, and uh, uh, there was some discussion about doing that for a um, uh, one of the. Um, um, presentations that we do uh, up at the Dark Sky site many, many, many years ago. Uh, it, was, it was figured that it would be a rather entertaining thing to, uh, to uh, sh- demonstrate an optical telescope with a, uh, a photodiode um, attached to it and convert the light to, uh, to an audio tone so you could actually hear some sort of variation <laughs> from, uh, from the light hitting the sensor. It's probably what you're talking about. I think similar, but probably a little bit different in, in its in its use. What uh, what uh, the intention is. So, yeah. Look, I, I, I oh yeah. Look, th- thanks for reminding me about that, Mike. I I, I might um, uh, I'll keep that in the back of my mind. There's that uh, once I get my observatory up because you, 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 I'm not sure if you're aware or not, but. Uh, I uh, I purchased some some while ago. I, I purchased a uh, a three meter scope dome, uh, which is currently sitting down the back on a pallet, and uh, I've got a, a three three point six meter square deck with power and data uh, fitted, and I'm just waiting for the installation team uh, to to come and install the dome. But once the dome is installed uh, then I'll be able to finally set up uh, I've got three telescopes to to experiment with and um, uh, I'll yeah I'll explore that idea of uh, of converting the starlight into a, an audio medium that's got potential <laughs> now that I can actually do something along those lines so very good thanks Mike for uh, letting me uh, reminding me of that one um, in fact, if you if you've got a, a link to that article that you're referring to, if it's available on the internet, it might be interesting to uh, uh, to see uh, to see that article if you can find the link. If there is a link uh, available for uh, on it somewhere, somehow, some way. We haven't heard Steve for a long time, uh, Mr. YJQ. Uh, he used to be a regular here on the Friday night session, but. Uh, uh, as the, I think the last time I spoke to him on the phone, he, he just said that Friday nights tend to be just too too long winded for him, and he tends to uh, to try and get to bed uh, fairly early. So because uh, he's off, he's often heading up to uh, to the dark sky site up at Heathcote. So if he's if he's making a trip up to Heathcote, he's uh, he's got a, definitely got an early night um, f- because there's a two and a half hour drive or a two hour drive at least for him. So. But no, look, Steve. Steve is uh, is the man at the moment, looking after the radio astronomy set up up there. He's um, he's uh, he's uniquely placed now to to uh, to look after the electronics side of what's what's going on uh, up at the observatory, which is really good. I'm, I'm glad that he's there. Uh, he writes some very very excellent documents. He's uh, with his engineering background. He's uh, he uh, he composes uh, documents like they're an engineering document, something I, I would have never been able to do. So <laughs> so uh, it's really good that he's he's um, involved with the radio astronomy group um, and uh, doing things, great things there. So uh, he's he's pretty much involved with that, including the Great Melbourne Telescope. He's still pretty much involved with that. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, all right. Thanks, Mike. Um, good to uh, to hear. Thanks for uh, coming up tonight. It's really good to see that uh, you're still uh, still kicking kicking the can around, <laughs> as they say. <laughs> All right, this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel. We're just going to have a quick listen on 80 meters for any other stations that might want to call in. All right, we've got uh, Brit there and VK3VIN Ian, uh, both doubled at the same time, but I managed to hear you. <laughs> G'day, Brit, VK3AOB, VK3EKH. Did a Uh, six inch, 150 mil of six inch reflector. 
Yeah, thanks, Britt. VK3 AOB, VK3 EKH with VK3 CSJ on the microphone. Yeah, thanks, uh, uh, Britt. Yes, um, I uh, I purchased a telescope myself uh, a long time ago. Um, it was uh, something LD, LD had. Um, it was all like it like. Uh, a friend of mine told me about it, and he says you should you should buy one because they're only, I think they're only about two hundred dollars. Uh, it's a real cheap, El Cheapo telescope. Um, uh, but what was unique about the telescope? Two things really uh, was the tripod. It was a really quite a good design tripod, very very sturdy tripod. But it also had a, a go to. Uh, mechanism on it, a uh, equatorial uh, mount that suits the telescope. Of course, it's only just a narrow telescope, and uh, narrow, it's a small telescope. Um, and um, but it, it was the it was the uh, the tripod uh, and the computer controlled uh, motor drive on it that has that had the value and. Um, it's got this mount mounting arrangement on it that it, you could easily attach a very small dish antenna. So you could chuck the telescope <laughs> and uh, put a, a small uh, um, a dish antenna, you know, a mesh, a light light mesh antenna or a or a, a grid pack, and uh, use the the go to mechanism to uh, track the moon. And that was my intention was to use that. Uh, set up to, uh, to, to to do moon bounce at 10 gigahertz or something along those lines which has never transpired uh, the telescope continues to sit just over the the back of the room here in fact in fact I could go and grab it and show you on on the TV here on the YouTube if you're watching um, but it's still a going concern it's uh, the, it's it's practically brand new from the day that I got it it just hasn't really been it, used as such it's just covered with dust at the moment but as far as optics are concerned well i don't know i've never explored it i don't know how 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 good the optics is for, it's just a cheap telescope so it really it really was just the tripod and the the uh, motor drive that uh, had my interest it's this ld special it's it's never reappeared ever since <laughs> it's just been it's just a one-off um anyway but um yeah no go and go and get your telescope out it sounds like a good one, and um, and do do that experiment with the uh, the microphone or with the uh, the photo diode or, uh, or or a video camera attached and see what uh, what transpires. I mean, it's the it's the one thing that I hope to do uh, is also do uh, exoplanet is to 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 try and um, detect exoplanets uh, orbiting their host star. Which can be done. The, there is software out there that will analyse the very, very small changes in, in light from a star, indicating that there's a, a planet that's just gone in front of its host star. They can do it. It's amazing stuff. It really is amazing. Um, okay, it's across to Ian, VK3VIN. We haven't heard you for a few Fridays, mate. VK3VIN, VK3EKH. Usually wake you up in time just to uh, the uh, callback. 
early hours. I usually wake up about 3.30, 4.30 in the morning and that's it. Friends, I just cannot get back to sleep, so we're all... Um, ...very disturbed now. The wax is on the window. Thanks, Ian. VK3VIN, VK3EKH returning. Very good. Uh, yep, you're hovering around 20 over 9, 10 to, 10 to 20 over. So uh, quite consistent. So your antenna's working okay. <laughs> um, but uh, no, you're more than welcome to, uh, to modify uh, its uh, orientation a little bit if it suits. Um, but no, you're coming down here uh, quite okay into uh, to Narry Warren. So not a problem there at all. Um, no, look, I, I, I was subscribing, and as far as I know, I still am subscribing to uh, Australian Sky and Telescope, so I've just opened up a, um, their website, which looks a little different, um, but I can see that what they're saying here, um, as of the current issue, which is July... 2023 Australian Sky and Telescope will be published only as a digital edition and that the paper edition will no longer be printed. Uh, why the change? Uh, the rise of digital subscriptions, particularly during the COVID lockdown period when a lot of news agencies were closed. And uh, as a consequent drop in sales of the printed edition means that the time has come to go fully digital. So they say here that we know this. This may um, we know that this may 
come as a disappointment to some, but the reality is that the time has come to say goodbye to the printed edition and move solely to digital. Uh, with the digital edition, you'll be able to read your favourite magazine anytime, anywhere, on your desktop computer, tablet or whatever. Um, you'll also be able to get uh, access to the, to the moment that it is published. No more waiting for the postman to come, a uh, news agency to, to deliver, to, uh, to arrive and all that sort of stuff. So it, they're still at it. They're still publishing. The, the Sky and Australian Sky and Telescope is still there, but it's just online. It's just online now. I should check my uh, membership uh, a subscription. I, I might have um, might have fallen uh, overdue, perhaps. I don't know. But I normally get notices from them when the, the next edition's available. So I'll I'll see what the story is with that. Maybe I've, uh, I've my subscription has dropped. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, it's a sign of the times, though, isn't it, Ian? Uh, these these sorts of things that uh, are sent to uh, to uh, to change the way things are done, and uh, it's it's just a matter of time before all all standard newspapers uh, are no longer being done, and uh, it's just all all going to be online. There's a lot of people out there that still prefer the printed matter. Uh, I, I know I I prefer a magazine or uh, or, or um, to, to look at a, an open newspaper rather than online but uh, these days it's a bit of a mix anyway all right thanks Ian good to hear you and uh, I acknowledge the late night business so um, yeah uh, look I, I know that there's there was uh, over the years there's been lots of uh, stations that have come in and gone as far as the callback is concerned and it's all partly because it's just too late so <laughs> which is fair enough anyway all right thanks Ian thanks everybody it's called in tonight uh Graham Martin Mike uh, Britton and Ian it's just a small group but that's okay at least there's uh, some folks out there that have listened to my dulcet tones <sighs> this is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel to all the stations up there on the chat window um <laughs> uh Bill VK3 KHT Cassiopeia uh, Richard, um, Kim, VK5FUSE, Stuart, VK3AUAO, uh, and Martin, VK7JAH. That's all I can see there. Um, so uh, thanks very much for listening in and tuning in. And I'm glad that the YouTube stream has actually held in. We had a few problems with the YouTube stream at the start, but that's actually managed to hold in. Thank goodness for that. This is VK3 EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, bidding everyone a very pleasant uh, evening, we say evening, and uh, have a nice weekend, uh, look after yourselves, we'll be back next Friday to uh, to carry on again like a pork chop. This is VK3 EKH, closing down on 3541 kHz. Good evening everyone. See you and take your mate. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, thanks, uh, Graham, and uh, cheers to you there, Mike. All right, we're out of here. This is VK3 EKH, echo VK3 CSJ, uh, concluding the TV side of it. Thank you for watching on YouTube and the TV. 
Uh, we'll be doing the WI broadcast this uh, Sunday morning at 10.30, uh, also on 160. Um, I'm still waiting for reports from you guys to, to tune in to me at 9 o'clock on, uh, on 160, 18.25 to my AM service. And then at 10.30 I'll do the uh, repeat at, at, uh, um, on the Melbourne television repeater. This one you're watching right now. Uh, and then a repeat at 8 o'clock. So uh, until then... Um, have a good weekend and stand by for colour bars and, uh, and that'll be it for me because I am absolutely zipped. Um, haven't, quite, haven't quite got over the COVID yet but hopefully uh, by this time next week I'll be... I'm actually not too bad, it's just a bit tired, that's all. Anyway, cheers everyone, take care and uh, have a nice weekend. The K3 EKH, signing off.